the next part will be a fourth and last group of materials or, or molecules that we haven't talked about yet. So we've talked about nucleic acids, we've talked about proteins, and we've talked about carbohydrates. So the fourth group of biomolecules are called lipids. And unlike the other three groups, they don't have something in common that the others do. So nucleic acids, proteins, and carbohydrates all have a quality that they form polymers, right? So the nucleic acid is a, is a polymer of nucleotides, or deoxynucleotides. The proteins are polymers of amino acids. And as we saw in the last lecture, our carbohydrates can come together and form polycarbohydrates, right? So long chains like starch or amylose. In the case of lipids, however, they don't bond to one another in long chains. They do associate with one another and form like a cell membrane and such, but they're not covalently bound together. So it does not form polymers like the other three do. What the other three also have in common is a structural feature in common. So all the amino acids kind of look the same. They all have the same architecture. They differ in their R group, of course, but they have the same architecture. All the nucleotides have the same architecture. They differ in what base is attached, but everything else is the same. All the carbohydrates have the same generic formula, right? So there's this OH groups arranged in certain ways, or aldehydes or ketones, but they all have the same overall features or structures. Lipids, however, don't have that. They could come in a variety of shapes and sizes and molecular co constructs. But what lipids do have is a, a common ability to not be dissolved in water, right? So they're all hydrophobic. They're all insoluble in water, right? So it's more of a, a feature of what they can or cannot do rather than what they're made of. Okay, so we're going to look at quite a few lipid types as we go through this. The most uh, easy type to understand will be our just fatty acids. They're just simple carboxylic acids that have a very long carbon chain, so they're insoluble in water. Okay. The next will be triacylglycerols, which are building from that fatty acid backbone. So we're going to have some fatty acids built on uh, a backbone of glycerol, perhaps, or from uh, sphingosine. We'll talk about that one, too. So we have triacylglycerols and, and sphingosine compounds. The other is we can take some, some fatty acids and glycerols and put them together, but in addition, add more things, like we could put phosphates on it. So those would be called phospholipids. We could put uh, carbohydrates on it, you know, like glucose or other sugars and call them glycolipids. Or we could put them on proteins, right, and have proteins attached to lipids. We'll talk about those, how they embed themselves in a membrane. And then finally, we'll talk about steroids. So steroids or sterols are also in the lipid classification, although they look nothing like these other molecules, right? But again, they don't have to look alike. They just have to have the same property of being hydrophobic and water insoluble, right? So these steroids are fused ring compounds, right? And they're used as hormones. They're made from cholesterol generally. They're used as uh, signaling molecules. We can make vitamin D from cholesterol and other types, and we'll leave those to the end on how we make those. Okay, so let's start with, with our fatty acids first and get a definition of what we mean by uh, fatty acid, nomenclature, numbering, and so forth. Okay, so if you remember back from your organic chemistry again, if you have a carboxylic acid, any chain length, we look at the highest priority group, which in our case will be the carboxyl group, and you count carbons beginning with that one because it must be on the end, and you count one, two, three, four, all the way to the end of the chain, right? however many numbers it has. And the end of the chain will be the last number. Right? There's an alternative numbering scheme where we name the carboxyl carbon at the very end, just the carboxyl carbon or the carbonyl carbon, right? and the second carbon is called the alpha carbon. We did this with our amino acids as well, right? because the amino group was on the alpha carbon. And then we named the third carbon beta and the fourth carbon gamma and the fifth carbon delta and so forth down the chain, right? So we just go along the chain to the end of the chain and get to whatever letter we get to in our Greek alphabet. Also, no matter what letter the last carbon receives, right, if it's pi or rho or however far down the chain it might be in the Greek alphabet, we also give it the name omega because omega is the last letter in the Greek alphabet. 
So we refer to the first carbon as carbon number one, or the carbonyl carbon. Carbon number two are also known as the alpha carbon. Don't think alpha means one, it means two, right? And then beta, gamma, delta, epsilon, and all down the chain for numbers three, four, five, six, and so forth. But the last carbon in the chain, whatever letter it might get, it also gets designated as the omega carbon because it's the last carbon. Okay, so that's our nomenclature. I refer to an omega carbon or a beta carbon or carbon number three, you know what I'm talking about. Okay, so some examples of fatty acids, we could have them called saturated fatty acids or unsaturated fatty acids. Now by saturated, I'm not referring to the old 2N plus 2 formula. Right, you remember you learned that back in organic of a saturated alkane has a 2n plus 2 number of hydrogens for n being the number of carbons. That's not what I'm referring to when I say saturated here. I mean it doesn't contain any carbon-carbon double bonds. And of course it's got a double bond in it. It's a carboxyl group at the end. It's got a carbon-oxygen double bond. We know that. There is a site of unsaturation. But that's not what I mean by uh, uh, saturated or unsaturated fatty acid. We're referring specifically to carbon-carbon double bonds. Okay? So when I say I have a saturated fatty acid, I know there's a double bond at the end to the oxygen, of course, but there are no carbon-carbon multiple bonds. Okay? When I say an unsaturated fatty acid, I mean there's at least one carbon-carbon double bond. Right? There may be more than one. If there's more than one, we're going to call it a polyunsaturated fatty acid. Here, the word poly, or the prefix poly in this case, simply means more than one. doesn't mean many. It just means more than one. Okay, so uh, unsaturated fatty acid can be what's called a monounsaturated fatty acid, meaning only one, carbon-carbon double bond, or a polyunsaturated fatty acid, meaning more than one carbon-carbon double bond. Okay? And what are the consequences of those double bonds? Sure, it changes the formula by two hydrogens, but what are the physical consequences? So if you take a saturated fatty acid, like the one shown on the screen, uh, palmitate, you do not need to know the names of these, and you look at its structure, all those carbons, except for the first one, are tetrahedral carbons. Right? The first one has a trigonal planar geometry, but carbon number two onward, or alpha onward, are all tetrahedral. And the most stable arrangement is in the arrangement you see on the screen. It doesn't look linear, but if you zoom out far enough, it does look like a straight line. Right, so it's a linear arrangement of this tail, where all the atoms line up the way you see them lined up, the zigzag pattern that we like to draw. Right? And it tells you the carbons are virtually in a straight line. Right? From far enough away, it looks like a straight line. As opposed to if I have a double bond, a carbon-carbon double bond in the middle of the chain. If you put that in there, those two carbons, again, are experiencing a different geometry. Right? So those are going to be trigonal planar geometry one time, which means it does not rotate. And when you have trigonal planar geometry for those two carbons and that double bond, it can take on one of two forms, assuming it's not at the end of the tail. It can be cis or it can be trans, right? In the trans form, not much has changed. If you zoom out far enough, it still looks like a straight line. But in the cis form, there's definitely a kink in the chain, right? It's shown by oleate on the bottom right, there's definitely a kink in the chain of this molecule. Okay, so saturated fatty acids are nice and straight. And unsaturated fatty acids, if they're cis, which they generally are predominantly cis, have this kink in the chain. And some other definitions I want you to know. The entire thing is called a fatty acid, of course, right? because it's got a carboxylic acid group at the end. But it's a carboxyl group, which has a pKa around you know, 4 or so. So under physiological conditions, it'll be ionized. right? It'll deprotonate and be the conjugate base. Right? So, for example, at the top left, we have palmitic acid, but in the ionized form, a deprotonated form, it'll be palmitate. Remember, the carboxylic acid's conjugate base is called a carboxylate. Right? So this is a palmitate. Which of these two species is favored under cellular conditions? The protonated or deprotonated? Well, we look at cellular conditions, about pH 7. And then the pKa is somewhere around 4 to 5. So we're definitely, 7 is more basic than the pKa, right? This, these factors and these, these tricks and what you've learned in the first blocks do not go away. We're going to keep applying them. So 7 is more basic than the pKa, so it tends to be more deprotonated. So under physiological conditions, it's going to exist as palmitate, right? 
So we have our fatty acid, we have our fatty acyl group, and that includes everything except the O minus at the end. And then of course, if we don't include the first carbon, then we don't have any hydrophilic pieces at all. It's just a hydrocarbon or hydrophobic tail. That's what we're gonna to refer to there. Okay. And again, the numbering system shown on the top right for you, one through 12 in this case, number two being alpha, three beta, four gamma, delta, epsilon, all the way down the scale. And the last one, no matter what letter, Greek letter we get to, we also call it the omega carbon. So number 12 is also the omega carbon in this case. Okay, so most fatty acids are not floating around as free fatty acids at all. And in fact, they're not even floating around as the fatty acid conjugate base, like the palmitate there. They're generally attached to something else. Right, the type of attachments is what we're going to cover after we finish fatty acids. There's lots of attachments. Okay. But let's finish our nomenclature of fatty acids. Do I want you to memorize all these names? Absolutely not. What I want you to notice about this chart. So the first thing that should stand out to you on this chart is what? I look at table 10.1, and what's the immediate thing that stands out in this chart? Even numbers. They're all even-numbered carbons, right? Does that mean all fatty acids are even-numbered? No, but most of them are, right? So there are some odd-chain fatty acids out there, and that's totally true, but most fatty acids have an even number of carbons, and that's a consequence of how they're made. They're generally assembled two carbons at a time. So you start with two, you add two more, you add two more, and you keep going until you arrive at the length that the enzyme will stop. And in that case, it has two to the power of n number of carbons, which is still an even number, right? The only way to make an odd chain fatty acid is to start with a carbon chain that is an odd number, like three, right? And two with that number, you keep adding two at a time, right? Because they're always assembled two at a time. So if you start with an odd chain, then you'll end with an odd chain. But by far, most fatty acids that are synthesized by mammals or animals and plants and bacteria in general are of even number of carbons, okay? The next thing you'll notice is there's a lot of these with no double bonds, right? They're just straight chain, right? No double bonds in them. Later on, you see it near the bottom of the chart, we introduce one or more double carbon-carbon double bonds, okay? And the effect of those will put kinks in their chain. Do I want you to memorize all those names? No. Here's how we're going to learn their names. I want you to write down, let's pick one of the list. How about the first one, right? The, the laurate or lauric acid, okay? How do I want you to memorize its name? I don't care if you learn laurate or not. I want you to memorize it as a 12-O fatty acid. So you write 12, you put a colon, and then you write the number zero. And that tells you everything you need to know about that fatty acid. Its number of carbons and how many carbon-carbon double bonds it has. Everything else about it is defined. Okay, so just write 12 colon zero. We're going to call it a 12-O fatty acid. That's all you need to know about it. And that's true for the half this chart. I'd write 14-0, 18-0, 24-0, and so forth. When we add, start adding carbon-carbon double bonds, I need to know things about them. For instance, for the oleate, let's look at that one on the list, oleate. 18 carbons, one carbon-carbon double bond. I need to know how many carbon-carbon double bonds it has, so I write it as 18 colon 1, but I need to know something about that double bond. In fact, I need to know two things about it. I need to know where it is in the sequence, what position is it in, and is it cis or trans? So in the case here, I would write 18 colon 1, then I draw a little delta symbol, the little triangle, and as a superscript after that, I tell you where it's located. And for oleate, it happens to be on carbon number 9. Now the double bond itself is between carbon 9 and 10, but remember your rules for naming where double bonds are, you name them by the lowest IUPAC number, right? So if it's on between carbons 9 and 10, the double bond is at position 9. Okay? The double bond can never be the last one in the chain. Right? If you have 18 carbons, the double bond can't be on 18 because there is a 19th carbon to which it would be double bonded. Right? So it can never be on the last carbon. It can be involving the last carbon. Let's say we had an 18 carbon chain with a double bond at the end of the chain. It would be on number 17. Okay? So the nomenclature I want you to learn is tell me how many carbons it has, put a colon, tell me how many carbon-carbon double bonds it has, and if that number is not zero, you need to tell me where they are. For example, let's look at arachidonic acid at the bottom of the table. 20 carbons, so I'd write 20 colon 4, 
and then a delta symbol, and then above the delta symbol as a superscript, I'm just going to give you a list. I'd write 5, 8, 11, 14. Just 5, 8, 11, 14. You don't have to put a bunch of delta signs. Just one will do. So I tell you where all those things are, and at the very beginning of the molecule, just like you did back in organic, you tell me if it's cis or trans for every possible choice I have to make. Here they're all cis, so I could write cis, 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 cis if I wanted to, or just indicate it as all cis. Generally when you have three or more, it's easier to write all cis than it is to write it out cis multiple times. Right? If you don't write anything at all, it's also assumed to be cis, because by definition most of them are cis. They rarely aren't, and when they are, trans will let you know. Okay? But for the, to be correct, we would write out cis, trans, cis, trans if, if that's what they are. Here's some examples of that. All of these have 18 carbons. So of these three, I know the one on the left says stearate, and then oleate and linolinate, but I don't, I don't want you to memorize those names. I want you to memorize the formula we just did. So stearate on the far left, how would you rewrite that in our new vocabulary? Eighteen colon zero. 18 O, exactly. So 18 colon zero, and is this saturated or an unsaturated fatty acid? Saturated. Saturated. So 18 O, and I'm done. That's all you had to write. Very simple. Right? How about oleate in the center? 18 colon one. 9. Right. 18 colon one, delta nine. So, and in front of that, you would put. Cis. cis, right, because it is a cis arrangement around this double bond, right? So you'd write cis, 18, colon, 1, delta, and then superscript, 9, because that's where it is, okay? And the one on the right, also unsaturated, in fact, it's polyunsaturated, has 18 carbons. What would you write for the full name? Cis. It looks like they're all cis. So cis, 18 colon, 3, delta, superscript, 9, comma, delta, superscript, 12, comma, delta, superscript, 15. Right. So to repeat what you said there, you could write cis out three times, or you could say all cis, because they are all cis. Then you'd write 18 colon, 3, because there's three carbon-carbon double bonds, delta, and then as superscripts, tell me where they are. Nine comma twelve comma fifteen. If the the middle one happened to be trans, it's not in this picture, but let's say it were trans, right? We'd have to turn this whole part around here. And if it were trans in the middle one, how would we indicate that? Well, we do it at the very beginning of the molecule. We'd say cis, because I'm referring to the first one, trans, referring to the second one cis referring to the third one. They're in the same respective order as the numbers after the delta sign. So if the middle one were trans, we would say cis trans cis, 18 colon 3, delta, superscript 9, 12, 15. I know which one refers to it because they're in the same respective order. Okay, like that. You don't have to write out those full names. You're only interested in the short version we did. 18O, 18-1 delta 9, 18-3 delta 9, 12, 15. That's how I want you to refer to these. And that's how I'll refer to them on the exam. I'm not going to write a linoleic acid and expect you to know what it means. Okay. So the other thing I want to talk about is that other nomenclature system using the, the Greek letters, right? So number two was alpha, number three was beta, and so forth down the chain. But the very last carbon also got the designation omega. Okay, so looking on the far right here at the top, we have a fatty acid kind of flipped upside down. So number one here is at the bottom, the carboxyl group. And then I have a number of CH2s, however many there might be. At some point, we have a double bond in it, wherever it might be. And then we have the end of the chain at the very top of the screen, the last carbon. So this last carbon is called the omega carbon, okay? because it's the last carbon in the chain. The carbon just before the omega carbon is called the omega-1 carbon. You can think of it as a minus sign, omega minus 1, right? 
It's just a dash, but if you want to, you can think of it as a minus sign. So omega minus one. The next carbon would be omega minus two. The next one back would be omega minus three. So it's that many from the omega carbon, right? That's how we're thinking about it. So the position of this double bond is three carbons from the end because we name it still, we, again, we name it for the closest of the two to the carbon number one. Right, carbon number one is the carboxyl group down at the bottom. So of the two carbons of this double bond, the one on the lower half is the closest to the carboxyl group. That's its, where it gets its name. So if this had, you know, you know, I don't know, 16 carbons and this was number 15, right, that's where it would be, or 12, or whatever it might be. But it gets a number based on the other end the same way. So this would be the omega carbon in green at the top, the omega minus one, the green CH2, omega-2, the top carbon of the double bond, and omega-3, the bottom carbon of the double bond. So this is an omega-3 fatty acid. You've probably heard this, and you read it on the back of food labels, and you hear it in advertisements, that you need omega fatty acids. Well, this is what they mean. They mean fatty acids where the double bond occurs so far, or such a distance, from the end of the chain. Right? It doesn't matter how long the chain is, but it's always this reference to the end of the chain. Right? This could be 18 or 20 or 30 carbons long. There could still all be omega-3 fatty acids because the double bond is three carbons from the end. That's what this means. If it were six carbons from the end, it'd be omega-6. If it's seven carbons from the end, it's omega-7. It could be any number. Right? It can't be omega. It has to be at least omega minus one because you can't have it after the end of the chain. But what this means is we're only talking about the very last double bond. If you have one with multiple double bonds, like our, our arachidonic acid we just had with the 20 colon 4, or the 18 colon 3 one we looked at, we're only concerned with the last one. Okay? So taking these on the right, the three examples I have here, what type of omega fatty acid are these three examples on the right at the bottom? Are they omega-3s, omega-6s, omega-5s, omega-9s? What are they? What is the first one? Omega-3. Right, and the second one? Four? No, three again. Also omega-3. Is it also omega-6? Yes. No. You can only have one. Remember, omega designation is only concerned with the last carbon-carbon double bond. If you're not the last, you don't qualify. There can only be one last double bond. So each of these looks like there's a double bond at 3, 6, and 9 away from the end. But only the last one matters. So in each of these three cases, they are omega-3 fatty acids and no more. All right? These are not omega-6. These are not omega-9 or 12 or anything else. Only the last one matters. You can't be more than one omega type. Okay? So why do we need these omega fatty acids? Well, if you put a kink in the chain near the end, you kind of change the arrangement of how they'd interact with each other. If you had a straight chain versus a kink in the chain, because these are all cis double bonds, the way they interact with one another is quite different. They can't form as tight a network with this double bond in there. So they're, they're melting points. Or change and their boiling points change okay so where do we get these things because we don't make them right so where do we find our omega-3 and 6 and other types of fatty acids well we get them from fish we also get them from plants we get them from a better way to say it would be organisms that do not regulate their internal temperature right that's the old way of saying that was cold-blooded but plants don't have blood so it's a terrible way to say that so the, it's organisms that do not regulate their internal temperature. Their internal temperature is the same as their surroundings, right? So fish often have this. I don't mean warm water fish. I mean cold water fish, right? Their body temperature is the same as the water. So they need some way of keeping themselves from freezing. So if you have a membrane that is completely made of saturated fatty acids, 18 O's, 16 O's, and so forth, the tails are straight. And when you form that lipid bilayer, the tails can easily compact or pack with each other, and the membrane at that temperature would be a solid. Right? And a solid membrane is not a very useful membrane. It has to be fluid. 
So they introduce these double bonds near the tails, so they can't form a solid. It stays fluid. It still moves, so the, the cells won't be dead. They won't be frozen. Whereas animals, like us, with a, an internal regulation of our body temperature, no matter our surroundings, right? We try to maintain the same internal temperature. We can get away with our fatty acids being all straight chain because we keep a warm enough temperature such that they stay fluid. And that's really what determines our body temperature is our fatty acids. So if the fatty acids are all straight and we maintain a warm body temperature, then we don't have to worry about them freezing. But if our core temperature drops to our surroundings, that membrane's gonna freeze, right? So we need to get some, some fatty acids with omega-3s and omega-6s in them from our diet because we don't make them on our own. We use them for other things like um, signaling molecules and antihistamines and things like that but we can't make them from our own fatty acids because we don't have any double bonds in ours so we need to get these in our diet in order to make other things okay. so what do we use these fatty acids for well what's the point the uh, fatty acids in general are used to make membranes of course they're structural things like that we can make other molecules from them but a lot of times we're using them as a means to store food for later Right? So we're storing food as fat for later. And the reason being, it's very dense storage, right? And it's, it's stable storage. There's no oxygens in it except at the very tip, right? And we can store these in large cells called adipose tissue, right? And have plenty of this around, right? And if you're on the North American or American diet, we have lots of it around, unfortunately. So why would animals do such a thing? Well, we're not constantly eating, right? If we had a smooth influx of materials every second of every day, we wouldn't store these as fats, right? We would have a constant food source, but animals in general don't eat constantly, right? So they have a meal and then they don't have food for a while. And then we have another meal and then we don't have food for a while. So we need to store them in between meals. Now, I don't mean three meals a day. I mean, some animals don't eat, but every few days, you know, uh, especially say, you know, crocodiles eat every few weeks perhaps. So when they get food, they need to store it so they can slowly use it later. Another example is when bears do this, right? They need to stock up on all these fatty acids because they're going to go and sleep for a while, right? For quite a few weeks to months, right? Depending on the length of the winter, they're hibernating. So let's, let's see how much energy we get out of these things. So the energy produced from the oxidation of these fatty acids, which we'll do when we get to metabolism later, right? is far greater than what we could get out of, say, a protein or a carbohydrate, right? So the fatty acids contain more energy per carbon than proteins or carbohydrates. So they're more energy dense. The difference is they're not as easily accessible. So proteins and carbohydrates can be rapidly metabolized for energy, right? Whereas fatty acids being just hydrocarbon tails, it's difficult to do that very first oxidation. It's a much slower, more deliberate process and not as fast a production of energy. But overall, there is more. So if you want long-term storage of energy-dense material, fatty acids are the way to go, and as long as you don't need to access rapidly. If you want access rapidly, carbohydrates are the way to go. They're just not as energy-dense. Okay? So when we store these things in, let's say, an animal, right? let's assume the animal is it's still alive, these things are going to be stored in cells that are at their normal body temperature, say 37 degrees, right? And that material will be accessible in the membrane. But if it were to cool off, let's say the animal is now, you know, a slab of meat there, that material is going to be a solid, right? You know, you see muscle there, the protein in there, but around the edges of the protein is a lot of adipose tissue there. And those fats are mainly made up of saturated fatty acids, right? All straight carbons you see at the bottom. They pack together really well. And so its melting point is around 69 degrees Celsius. So their body temperature never gets that high, right? But it maintains it such that it's not a liquid, but it remains more fluid. Whereas if you cool that off to, say, room temperature, it will be a solid, right? Like you see in the picture. Let's contrast that with if we have some double bonds in it. So let's put some double bonds in the same length molecule. So again, 18 carbons here, but we put that carbon-carbon cis double bond in there. Its melting point drops tremendously to 13 degrees Celsius, right, which is below room temperature. 
So at this point, even at room temperature, if we cool these things down, it's still a liquid, right? We'll call these oils, right? Whereas we call the ones that are solid at room temperature fats, right? The source is irrelevant, although most fats come from a, a warm source, right? A, a uh, organism that maintains its internal high body temperature like an animal and then oils generally come from organisms that don't maintain an internal temperature like plants or cold water fish like north atlantic cod right so those are the ones that turn out when you when you extract all their lipids they maintain as oils we also got these from whales for instance right they they have a, a much lower body temperature than say a rabbit does so their body temperature needs to be regulated but they stay much colder in the ocean. So the whale oils weren't called fats, even though it's an animal, right? So it all depends on the temperature at which it melts, not so much the source, okay? And as you see on the pictures on the left, uh, the double bond, if it's cis, puts a strain, a kink in the chain, whereas if it's trans, really has minor effect on the, the straightness of that chain, right? So if it's a trans double bond, the melting temperature doesn't change much at all. It's still around 69 degrees. But if it's got a cis double bond, that temperature dropped drastically to 13 degrees. Okay? And the idea here is to compare the, the picture on the bottom right here, where those can pack tightly together, whereas it's difficult to pack tightly together when you have all these cis double bonds. This is why the melting temperature is so much lower. Melting temperature is the same thing as freezing temperature. They mean the same thing from different points of view, right? depending on which direction you're traveling, up or down to scale. So these take a lot lower temperature to turn into a solid, a lower freezing point or a lower melting point than if it were a straight chain, right? And we generally have the designation that it's an oil if it's a liquid at room temperature, and we call it a fat if it's a solid at room temperature. So if you have something that is an oil, but if you leave it outside and the temperature outside drops drastically, you know, below 13 Celsius, it will solidify in the container. So it's still an oil because it's liquid at room temperature. That's the definition. Okay. So moving on to, to what we can do with these triacylglycerol or these fatty acids, and we'll turn them into triacylglycerols. So what we're doing at the bottom here is taking a glycerol molecule. Glycerol is a very simple alcohol. It's a three carbon chain, so a, a propane with three OH groups on it. So it's a triol or trial. And it's 1,2,3-propane triol, if you want the actual name. But it's a three-carbon molecule with an OH on each carbon. It is not a sugar. right? If you look at the formula, it doesn't fit. It doesn't have the aldose or ketose group. It's, in fact, one oxidation away from being the simplest sugar. Okay? We're going to take that glycerol. We're going to take three fatty acids and bond them to it. So if you want the biology version of that, that's the picture on the right, where they like writing names in boxes and coloring them different things and pointing at bonds and don't describe bonds. Just call it an ester bond. If you want the chemistry version of it, we have the glycerol molecule on the left, and we're going to take those three OHs, and each of those oxygens is going to attack the carbonyl of the fatty acid next to it. So we're going to get three nucleophilic attacks. And in between the two, we're going to lose a water molecule and make three ester bonds, as you see the triacylglycerol, sometimes called triglycerides, same thing. Okay? So I take one glycerol, three fatty acids, put them together, lose three water molecules in the process, and I get my triacylglycerol. So I've condensed this. I've taken three fatty acids and put them together on a glycerol to store it. So this is our storage form of fatty acids. Here's the chemistry of that reaction. I have a glycerol on the left, I have three fatty acids in the center, and they react with each other. You lose three water molecules, and you get the triacylglycerol. My question for you is where does the water originate? So I know where the H's come from. I see in each of these cases, right, two H's, and I see two O's, but I don't know which O is the one that remains here in the triacylglycerol and which one leaves as the water. How do you know which one is which? So, Isn't it the O from the glycerol that attacks the carbonyl carbon and the fatty acid? Yes, so this O here from the glycerol exactly attacks the carbonyl carbon. So that means the O that leaves in the water is from which molecule? The fatty acid. The fatty acid, from the fatty acid right. So the, the H2O here is the 
OH that was on the fatty acid plus a proton from the glycerol. All right, so this OH, and not necessarily this proton, but a proton, right, is added to it to make water. The O in the glycerol remains as the ester. Okay? And how do you test this experimentally? How would you determine that? Could you do like a, a deuterium swap? So in deuterium, we're labeling the hydrogens, right? Yeah, we, we could see the hydrogens. We know both hydrogens do end up in the water. That wasn't our, our goal. Find out which of these oxygens ends up in the water. By labeling the hydrogen as deuterium, we can't answer that question. Right. So similar to what you're thinking, but how, what would you do instead? Do you use a different isotope of oxygen? Exactly. So I'm going to label the oxygen. Perhaps I label only the oxygens in the fatty acids. Right? I don't label the glycerol at all. I could do it the other way if you want, but let's do it this way. I label the oxygen here in the fatty acid. This oxygen. right? The OH. I do not label the OH in the glycerol. I do this reaction, and every time I will see the radioactivity never ends up in the triacylglycerol. It's always in the water that's released. So then I perform the other experiment. I label the oxygens of the glycerol exclusively. I do not label the fatty acids oxygens. And now I find all the radioactivity, all the heavy oxygen, will be in the triacylglycerol and never in the water. Those two experiments confirm that this OH, the one on the fatty acid, is the one that leaves. Right? It confirms our mechanism. Okay. So the other thing I want you to get out of this is if I give you a question like the one below, is I want you to draw a triacylglycerol for me, made from glycerol and three identical fatty acids. Now, I wouldn't give you the fatty acid name this way. I would name it a little differently. I would say cis, instead of saying octadecanoate, which means 18, right? I would say cis 18 1 delta 9, which tells you everything you need to know, right? It's 18 carbons long. There's one carbon-carbon double bond, it's on position number nine, and it's cis, right? And there's three of those. So it would look almost like the ones above, at least the, the beginning part of it would look identical, the ester bonds. But then down the chain, I would need to put in the carbon-carbon double bond somewhere. So be able to do that, depending on if I give you the same fatty acid three times or three different fatty acids. Okay, so here's an example where I give you that answer and ask you, what was it made from? Right? So we're reversing the question here. So at the top, we have a picture. I'd like you to tell me, what was this molecule made from? Right? Well, at the beginning here, you clearly see a glycerol. So it was definitely made from glycerol. And it was made from three different fatty acids. They're not all the same. The first fatty acid, what would you describe it as? If you had to give me its, its name, the way we're doing it, what would the first one's name be? The first fatty acid at the top. Just call it 18 colon O. Right, an 18 O fatty acid, exactly. So this is carbon number one. There are 16 more. That's, that's carbons numbers two through 17. And then there's the methyl at the end to make 18. So this would be 18 carbons, no carbon carbon double bonds. And you don't have to put any deltas after it, right? Because there's no, there's no positions. So it's just 18 O. Remember, this carbon is number one of the fatty acids, not part of my glycerol. The glycerol is all over here. Right. The very last one is also easy, right? It would have a total of 14 carbons, number one, numbers two through 13, and then number 14, the methyl group. So again, this would be a 14O fatty acid at the bottom. The one in the center is a little more difficult. There is a single carbon-carbon double bond. Now, it's not indicated if it's cis or trans, so we're going to assume it's cis, right? So how many total carbons does it have? Well, we have carbon number one where it's attached. We have seven CH2s, that's carbons numbers two through eight. I have a carbon-carbon double bond that includes carbons numbers nine and 10. Then I have seven more CH2s, that's number 11 through 17. And then I have a CH2 at the end, which makes 18, right? It's just adding, just one, two through eight, nine, 10, 11 through 17, and then 18. So there's 18 carbons. 
So the middle one would be called what? Delta nine. So it's 18 colon 1 delta 9, exactly, because the double bond is on the, the 9 and 10th carbon, so number 9. Is it an omega-3 fatty acid? No. No, it is not. Is it what? What would be its omega designation? Omega-9. And why omega-9? Because there's nine carbons from the uh, double bond to the uh, end of the the tail. Right. So I think this this might be a poor example of explaining this because it's not because the double bond is on number nine. It's because it's on the nine from the end. There happen to be 18 carbons. So it's on number nine, and there are 18 carbons, and 18 minus nine is nine. That's why it's omega nine. If this thing had 30 carbons, right? and it's on number nine, the omega would not be nine. It would be omega 21, because 30 minus nine is 21. Right, that's how you get the omega rating. Okay, and I mentioned this already at the bottom, the difference between fats and oils, uh, it's, they're the same thing, they're all triacylglycerols, but if it's a solid at room temperature, 25 Celsius, we're gonna call it a fat, no matter its source. Most often it's gonna come from an animal source but it doesn't have to. We're gonna call it an oil if it's a liquid at room temperature. This is often from a plant source or a fish, but it doesn't have to be. So it just depends on its structure, whether it's gonna be a liquid or a solid, and that gives it the terminology, oil or fat, respectively. Okay, so we can do some other chemistry as well. Let's take the, the fat or oil, whatever it might be, depending on the state at room temperature at the bottom, Instead of breaking it apart using water and getting back just the glycerol and three fatty acids, we're going to use water under basic conditions. So a sodium hydroxide here. And we're going to have glycerol and three fatty acid conjugates, right? So we're going to make salts, right? So you remember, if you add an ester to water, right, under slightly acidic conditions, you'll break it apart into the alcohol and the fatty acid you started with. But if you do it under basic conditions, you will still break the ester into the alcohol, in this case glycerol, and the fatty acid, but the acid will immediately react with the strong base, and you remember from Gen Chem that acid and base react to give you a salt and water, right? So we regenerate our water, and we're left with these sodium salts on the right, okay? And this is what we call soap. So I'll, I'll tell, I always tell this little story of uh, my grandfather who used to make soap, and his, a great-grandfather and so forth would make soap in the yard right and they would this is long before I was born but they were they would take uh, lard from whatever was butchered in the neighborhood or in the, the town that day right they didn't waste anything and if you butchered a hog and there was leftover fats and you put them in a big pit in the ground right not very deep just a shallow pit and then you went to the hardware store and you bought some lye which was your base and then you had to add some water, which you could get from a garden hose or a bucket, right, from the swamp behind the house. I grew up in Louisiana, so with lots of water around. You pour that on it. You take a wooden paddle. You would not want to use metal because you're going to ruin your metal paddle. So you take an old wooden stick, and you, you stir it around, and I'm sure it smelled wonderful. But you stirred it around, and you did this reaction. and You get glycerol and your fatty acid salts. And over time, the glycerol, which is soluble in water, the fatty acid salts, which are not soluble in water, would separate because you're letting it sit and bake in the sun, right? And the glycerol would float to the top and you come along with your stick or your shovel or whatever and you scrape off the glycerol off the top. And that glycerol is could be used as an, an oil or a lubricant for something, right? So, you know, you can grease a bearings in a tractor or something like that with it. It's not very good, but why waste it? It's, it's useful. So you could use that, scrape it off the top and even though, you know, I grew up there and my family was, was grew up French, they, they didn't know Le Chatelier, but he understood what he was doing. If you remove a reactant, right, the reaction will slow down and maybe proceed backwards if it's feasible. If you remove a product, it tends to go more in the forward direction, right? You're, you're creating a, a disturbance to the equilibrium and it tries to restore equilibrium. So he keeps removing the glycerol off the top, which causes the reaction to go towards the right. He could also add more lye and more water and cause it to go to the right. 
So he eventually drives it all the way to the right until everything is gone. All the water is gone, all the glycerol is gone, and it bakes to dryness in the sun. And when it's dried and done, those areas on the, on the lawn, you just go out with a, a knife and cut out a little corner, and that's a bar of soap. Right? So you've made soap when it dried. And it's not very good soap. I'm sure my grandmother wouldn't allow it in the house. But it was great for washing off tools. It was great for washing the tractor or you know, whatever, you, the barn wall or whatever you used it for. But it, it was a terrible soap as far as how it smelled. And, and I'm sure it, it wasn't very pleasant to put on your skin because you probably had a lot of sodium hydroxide left over. But it was a great soap or detergent to use for washing certain tools in the yard and things like that. But this is the reaction they were doing. They were taking the fats or the oils that were left over from the animal or plant or whatever it was and doing saponification, which is just hydrolysis of an ester under basic conditions. And you get back your alcohol, glycerol, but you also get back the sodium salt, right? Or the fatty acid salt, which was the soap. All right, so instead of taking our a triacylglycerol and making that, let's assemble it a little differently. So instead of taking the, the glycerol and putting three fatty acids on it, let's only put two, right, and leave the third spot on the glycerol open for something else. Okay, so on that other piece, we could put a phosphate, we could put a sugar, we could attach it to a protein, we could put all sorts of things in that spot. And we'll see what kind of things we'll make. These are going to be our phospholipids and glycolipids and so forth. Right? So what we're doing is instead of having a glycerol with three fatty acid tails on it, we have a glycerol which has three OH groups and we're going to put two fatty acids on. In place of the third fatty acid, we're going to put a different group on that OH. Right? So the things we can put on there are shown on the right here. So we have a basic structure at the bottom. I do it in the, the biology and the chemistry version again. So biology version at the top, where the, we have boxes with words in it. So we have a glycerol with two fatty acids attached. And then we have a phosphate group attached on the other alcohol group. And on the other side of the phosphate, we have an alcohol. So here at the bottom, as shown in, in more detail of what exactly is happening, we have our glycerol in the center, right, with its three carbons two of which are ester bonds to fatty acids, just like we've seen before. And the third carbon, instead of having a fatty acid attached, we put a phosphate on it. All right? And if you can imagine, on the first two carbons, those two long tails are very hydrophobic tails. Right? They're not going to interact with water very well, but they will interact with themselves and others like them. Whereas the third carbon's phosphate will love to interact with water. It's a charged, very polar molecule. And this is what you generally see when they draw the stick figure for the membranes of a ball with two tails. Okay? They call it a polar head group, and then they call it hydrophobic tails, and they have that lipid bilayer or liposome or whatever the structure drawn. They always do this little sphere with two tails. It really doesn't look like that at all. It's actually a glycerol with two tails attached, and on the other end of the glycerol is a polar head group. Right? Attached to the other side of the phosphate is some alcohol, right? Like shown in the picture at the top, it says alcohol. So what alcohol could we attach? Well, let's see. The molecule we're starting with here at the very bottom left is called phosphatidate. Right? It's your building block structure of a glycerol with two acyl fatty acids on it and a phosphate. Right? So a diacyl glycerol with a 3-phosphate. Right? On the top, we have various alcohols we could attach. One of them is an amino acid, serine. Serine's an alcohol, right? If we attach the amino acid through its R group, which is an alcohol, it's just like our figure at the bottom. We've got phosphatidate, and through the phosphate, we've attached the serine. So it's called phosphatidyl serine. Phosphatidyl is the adjective form of phosphatidate, just like methyl is the adjective form of methane, right? So phosphatidyl serine. Instead of using serine, we could put a cousin of serine on. It's serine, except we've replaced, I'm sorry, not serine. Let me, I'll get the other one. Like serine, we can use ethanolamine, right? It's ethanol, which is a lot like serine, but we don't have this carboxyl group anymore. Okay, so it's sort of like serine, but imagine serine without its carboxyl group. It's just ethanol with an amino group on it. So it's an ethanolamine, right? So phosphatidyl ethanolamine. 
instead of ethanolamine, use ethanolamine where the three hydrogens on the nitrogen have been replaced with other methyl groups. That's called choline on the top right. So you see all these are building on the same thing. So if I asked you to draw phosphatidylcholine after you finish panicking for three seconds, just realize it's a glycerol in blue, two fatty acids attached, a phosphate on the other side, then I attached an ethanol, I know you can draw ethanol, two carbon OH molecule, and then I put an amino group with three methyls on it. That's all choline is. It's just like ethanolamine with three methyls, which is just like serine without its carboxyl group. So they're all building on each other. The last one here is, or not last one, but the, the one on the middle right, is phosphatidyl inositol. So again, glycerol, two fatty acids, phosphate, and what looks like a sugar, right? Although it's missing an H up here, right? So it looks like a sugar, but it is not a sugar. It does have a ring structure. It does take, adopt the, the chair conformation or the boat conformation that you remember, but it's just a cyclohexane, right? There's no O in the ring. There's no aldehyde or carboxyl group or carbonyl. So it's just a, a cyclohexane with a bunch of OHs on it. Right? So it's a cyclohexane with six OHs. It's a sort of a, a pseudo sugar. It's not a real sugar. So we just call it inositol. Right? And it mimics the shape of a sugar, but it's not a sugar. Right? And the very last one at the bottom is a combination. Here I'm using my normal phosphatidate, which again in blue is the glycerol with two green fatty acids on it, the black phosphate, and then what's in red represents the alcohol I add to the other side. The alcohol in this case is another glycerol, right? So it's three carbons long, an O on each carbon. It's a glycerol. But it's also bridging another phosphatidate on the right. So this glycerol is actually bridging two phosphatidates. This is called diphosphatidylglycerol, because there's two of them on a glycerol, right? And this is only found in one tissue, and it's called cardiolipin. You probably can figure out which tissue type it's in. This is found in heart cells. Okay, so it has a very specific purpose in those cells. And these others are mainly your generic cell membrane, right? It's composed of a lot of phosphatidylserines and cholines and ethanolamines and inositols. Okay, so I want you to be able to draw these things, but it, they're not that complicated if you can memorize the basic structure on the left. So you got glycerol with only two fatty acids attached and a phosphate. And on the other side of the phosphate, I attach some alcohol. That's all I've done. And if you remember, you've already learned serine. You know what ethanol looks like. You've just learned choline. It's just ethanolamine with three methyl groups. And inositol is simply a six-membered hexane ring with six OHs on it. Right? And you've already learned glycerol for cardiolipin, so that's easy. Right, so let's change up something else. Here, instead of using glycerol, I'm going to use a different backbone. And the name comes from uh, the person who described it. Of course, that's generally how we do things in science, and uh, it's gotten a little crazy in the last hundred years, where the person who discovers it gets to name it. So when your generation starts naming, thing after, naming things after Pokemon, we'll understand. So you get to describe it and name it if you discovered it and described it. So the person who described sphingosine was from the UK, and at the time, they were very fascinated with what was being uncovered in Egypt. And so they uncovered this big outcropping of rock with a, a shape of a, a cat and a you know human head on it. And it, it. We're talking about the Sphinx. And they had no idea what it, per, its purpose was. It was, a, it was an enigma. And it's still a lot of that today. And so the person was very interested in that going on in Egypt at the time, probably to steal some artifacts because they did a lot of that. But he also was describing this sphingosine molecule. So he gets to name it, and he named it after the sphinx because he really didn't know what it was doing in the body. So he named it sphingosine after the sphinx. But if you imagine the, the sphingosine is a substitute for glycerol, right? I know it looks nothing like glycerol. It's so much bigger, right? But if you only look at the carbons on the end, so look at the first three carbons down here. So carbons one, two, and three on the very end of the molecule, and ignore the long tail, it sort of looks like glycerol. So if you look at the first three carbons, they have an OH, a nitrogen, and an OH. Other than the nitrogen, it looks like three OHs. One of them has been replaced with an amino group, yes. So a slight modification. And of course, on the third carbon, we continue with carbons four, five, six, seven, and so forth. And we have this long tail. 
okay? But in many ways, it behaves like glycerol. So the first carbon, it's OH, is where we're gonna attach, say, a phosphate, just like we would with, with glycerol. On the second carbon, instead of on the oxygen, we have a nitrogen, we're gonna attach a fatty acid. So this is gonna be, instead of an ester, it's an amide linkage. And the third carbon's OH, because of the tail, is inaccessible. We can't attach anything, we can't get close to it because of this long tail. So we just do nothing with it. But overall, when we're done, our sphingomyelin looks like it has two tails. One of them is an inherent built-in tail, and the other is the fatty acid we attach. So overall, it still has a gross, too long fatty tail thing. And on the other end, we again have a phosphate, and this happens to be choline right, attached to it. So it resembles the glycerol with the two fatty acid tails and the choline, but it's slightly different. It starts on a different starting material. And sphingomyelin is found where? Does anybody know where we find sphingomyelins? Uh, what type of cells? The name should give it away. Nerve system? Right, they're, they're in the myelin sheath of nerve, sh nerve cells, right? So sphingomyelins, it's in the myelin sheath of nerve cells, which is the ins electrical insulation along the axons, right? So these type of fatty acids attached to these backbones, right, sphingo island backbones, is where we find a lot of the, the they're, they're abundant in the, the cell membranes that surround these axons, okay? The other thing we can do to it is, if at the bottom here, we start with sphingosine one more time, we attach a fatty acid to the nitrogen, but instead of putting a phosphate on it, like we've been doing, we simply throw a sugar on there, like galu uh, galactose or glucose, right? So here, without the phosphate, we just stick the sugar directly on. These are called cerebrocytes, right? And you can probably guess what tissues they're found in. They're found in the brain, right? And they're very specific to the brain. We don't know exactly what they do, but this is the tissue that they're abundant in. So it has to have something to do with that cell's function. We call these glycolipids because they have a glyco group or a sugar attached. And our last group is going to be our steroids, right? So the steroid here on the left, you see there's four fused rings, right? They're not just connected to each other by a bond, they share a side. So this is inflexible, it's rigid, it's fused ring system does not flex at all, right? So this is a flat molecule, right? So this is called a steroid nucleus, and all steroid molecules are based on this, right? They have different foliage around the outside, right, depending what's attached, but they all have this 17 carbon core, right? So there's three six-membered rings and one five-membered ring all fused. And what I want you to know is not so much what the foliage is, but I want you to know these 17 carbons, how they're assembled and how they're numbered. Now the numbering system doesn't really make sense. It's just the way it was done. I don't know the rhyme or reason behind it. It was done long before I was around. And you just memorize it. So if you practice it about a dozen times, you'll have it. So I want you to draw this steroid core on the top left. So you draw a six-membered ring, draw another six-membered ring to the right of it, right? We're going to call that the A and the B rings. And then it's, instead of drawing a third six-membered ring directly on the side of it, we draw it to the northeast of it, right? Up to the side a little bit. We, they're going to share that side instead of the edge. So that's our C ring. And then to the right of that, we draw only a five-membered ring. We're going to call that the D ring. So we have A, B, C, and D rings. Okay. So to number them, we're going to start at the very top of the first ring you drew, which is probably where you started drawing, right? and call that number one. Okay. So we're going to go around the first A and B rings, one through ten. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Right. So around the first two rings, one through ten. So far, rather easy, right? You think you go around the whole molecule, but we don't. We go around the first two rings. When we get to number 10, there is no direct connection that we haven't already numbered, right? We've got number 1, 5, and 9. We've already numbered those. So instead, we hop up here to number 11. Don't ask me why. I don't know. I just memorized it a long time ago as well. All right? so we hop up to number 11. And now instead of going around the C and D rings, we go through them in a serpentine fashion, in an S shape. So it's 11, 12, 13, through the rings to 14, 15, 16, 17. So you make this S shape over here. So around the first AB rings, 1 through 10, and then S shaped 11 through 17. 
right? If you draw that a few you know, times or maybe a dozen times, you'll have it down. Okay, but if, if you draw that core structure, all steroids are based on this. Every one of them begins life as cholesterol, right? So cholesterol is our molecule, and from that, we're going to build all sorts of other things. Okay. All right, so here's our cholesterol molecule one more time, numbered 1 through 17. And two important features I want you to remember about the cholesterol itself, other than the steroid core. There is only one non hydrocarbon atom in this whole thing, right? You notice it's all hydrocarbon, carbons and hydrogens everywhere. There's only one atom in the whole thing that is not a carbon or a hydrogen. There is an OH group on carbon-3. It is the only remotely polar thing about this molecule, right? So if this were to orient itself in a membrane, it would be like a cork, right? So the whole molecule is hydrophobic, would embed itself in the membrane, and the OH would barely be poking the surface to interact with those phosphates along the surface. So this molecule orients itself like a bobbing cork with just the OH and number three sticking up near the surface. All right? So cholesterol is made by the liver, right? And we store it generally in the gallbladder and it's secreted into the bile duct in your small intestine as you need it to act as an emulsifying agent, right? To help you digest fatty foods. If you make too much cholesterol and it starts to crystallize in your gallbladder, you'll get what's called gallstones, right? So as a picture on the bottom, this is obviously not to scale, but you see these little rock-looking things inside this person's gallbladder. Uh, in the center is a sonogram showing uh, the size of this thing inside the, the void of the gallbladder. This is clearly not going to fit through the bile duct, so it's not going to come out. It's not entirely painful, but if it plugs the bile duct, then you're going to have some problems. And shown on the right, this is between someone's fingers, so it's fairly large here. Uh, it's just pure cholesterol in one of these gallstones. So the outside of it, you may notice, is a little darker than the bright yellow interior because it's becoming oxidized on the outside. It's making a hard, like almost cracked shell. And the interior is more of a, a buttery, soft cholesterol in the center, right? But none of this is going to be soluble in water. And so if you have these gallstones, there are a couple options. You can get what uh, my dad got. It's called lithotripsy. And they go in with a very high frequency sound and basically cause these little gallstones to explode, right? They don't, they don't have any uh, like dynamite in them or anything, but they don't, they don't turn into a fireball. They just cause them to fragment into many, many smaller pieces, and then you can pass those pieces through the bile duct, right? Or if you have trouble with it and your your gallbladder is not functioning at all, like my mom has, so I'm looking forward to my future. So you have to have your entire gallbladder removed, right? And the problem with that is you don't produce this emulsifying agent. So you can't go out and eat a whole cheesecake, not that you should do that in the first place. But if you eat a large quantity of fatty foods, suddenly it goes right through you. You don't have time to emulsify it and help digest it. So you have to eat many small meals instead of a few large meals once you have your gallbladder removed. Some other things we make from cholesterol are our steroid hormones like testosterone and estradiol at the top. You notice that core ring structure is still there. Estradiol is easy to remember because it's a diol. There are two OHs, on opposing ends of the molecule on carbons 3 and 17. And testosterone is a ketone, you notice by the ending, so that all important oxygen on number 3 has been oxidized to a ketone. All right? And then we have one called progesterone, I don't have a picture of it here for you, but it's also a ketone, and in this case you have a ketone on either end of the molecule, at number 3 and up near number 17 as well. Okay, and those are hormones used to do cell-cell communication, which we'll talk about next on Thursday. Okay. So if cholesterol is floating around the body, it's not soluble in water, that's bad, so we need some carriers for it. Right, so looking at the picture on the right, this is a, well, it was, it's a, a slide now, or a slice from a deceased person, but it was an open artery at one time, and the whole middle area is, is patent, and you can let blood flow through there. Whereas a clogged artery, as you notice on the bottom picture, has all that yellow cholesterol plaque in there, and very few holes left that blood could flow through. Right? And this artery is most likely which artery in the body? What's the most common artery to see this in? Does anybody know? Huh? 
No? So let's, let's think about it. Maybe you can figure it out from the description. So you have a, a carrier carrying your cholesterol around in the body, right? It doesn't float around in the blood on its own. It needs some kind of taxi to carry it around. But our taxi is more of a rickshaw. Anybody knows what rickshaws are? They're like, it's like a, a cart that people ride in and it's carried, like you have a, a human powered horse in the front, right? Instead of a horse, it's a human, right? Those are rickshaws and they're not very sturdy and they're not you know, very expensive transportation. You're very likely to fall out of it if it takes a sharp turn, is the idea. So here, your cholesterol is being carried by a, a carrier protein, which is like a rickshaw taxi. And if you have to make a sharp turn at high speed, you're going to fall out of this thing. So where in the body does blood make a high speed, high pressure, sharp turn? In arteries? Yes. Which artery is the question? Muscular? No, which artery has very high pressure, high velocity, and then suddenly makes a, a 90 or 180 degree turn? The aorta? Well, the aorta is where the pressure is going to be the highest, yes. And then where does it make a turn? The aortic arch is not a very sharp turn. It's a smooth curve. How about right before that, the first vessels that come off the aorta, the ones, the coronary arteries, right? Those are the ones that feed the outside of the heart itself. So you're under very high pressure in the aorta, right? This big vessel, big muscular vessel. And it's like being on a, a major highway and you're getting off at the next exit, right? And that exit is an immediate, you know, like 90 or 180 degree turn down to a surface street, right? And so you have to make this high speed turn. And if you don't slow down for those curves, you're gonna fall off the road, or in this case, fall out of your taxi. And that's where this happens. So it makes those sharp turns. And if there's a lot of cholesterol floating around with these, these rickshaw taxis, they're gonna fall out. And they tend to fall out and become roadkill because no one's picking them up. They're not water soluble. And so these plaques accumulate in the coronary arteries. And if it, if it occludes the artery, then you're gonna have a heart attack. Right, so this is a picture of cholesterol on the top right, shown in space filling diagram. You notice the one lone oxygen in red. And like I said, it looks like a cork, right? So it floats in the membrane, deep in the membrane, with only the oxygen barely making the surface, right? And the goal of this thing is to provide some bulk for the membrane, right? It provides two qualities to the membrane. One is, if the membrane were to cool down, right, all those long tails try to come together and form a solid. But if you have cholesterol in the membrane, it's difficult for them to come together. This thing is very bulky. It gets in the way, right? So your membrane will stay fluid at a lower temperature if cholesterol is present. On the other end of the spectrum, if the membrane is starting to heat up and the molecules are flying everywhere, the, the tails are losing cohesion and they're not forming a, a membrane anymore. They're all going their separate way. That membrane is rupturing. That's bad. But with cholesterol present, not because it's bulky, but because it's rigid, they have something to hold on to, like a scaffolding. So it makes the membrane more stable at higher temperatures. So what cholesterol does overall on both ends is it widens the range at which a membrane is more fluid, right? In other words, it widens the range at which that cell can survive in temperature, okay? And that happens in, in mammals have it. Yeast make a, a version of cholesterol called ergosterol. It's very similar. And then we also have it in our kale cells, right? Make a version of this molecule. Bacteria do not make this molecule. Okay. So we can also attach proteins to lipids, right? We did this with sugar, so we can also do it with, with lipids. We can take a fatty acid like the one at the top. We take our long chain fatty acid here and attach it to a side chain of cysteine, right? So this is a thioester bond, not so stable. We could cut it off later if we want to. On the right, we have, a, again, uh, cysteine being attached, but in this case, it's just a methyl ester, right? So here we have the cysteine with its methyl ester in being attached to the tail of a lipid. So here the lipid was being attached to the cysteine. Here the cysteine is being attached to the tail of a lipid. So we can do it either way. This one, however, is not an unstable thioester bond. It's simply a thioether. Yeah, that's more stable. We can also do the thing you see at the bottom. It looks rather complex, but it's not. It's called a GPI anchor. 
So we have, if you look in the center, we have a glycerol with two long green fatty acid tails on it. On the other side, we have a phosphate. And then we have that inositol. This is not a sugar. It's kind of the fake sugar, right? It's the mimic of the sugar. And then we have several other sugars, one uh, blue square here, whatever sugar that might be. Could be a, a glis, I mean, a glucose or a galactose or a mannose or something like that. We have a different one in green. We have all sorts of connections and other R sugars attached. On the very other end of the molecule, we finally have it attached to the tail end of a blue protein there. So this is the carboxy terminus of a protein. What did this accomplish? So our blue protein may be soluble in water, but it's now attached to this elaborate tail, which has a green part, which embeds itself in the membrane. So it's an anchor to the membrane. That's why it's called this GPI anchor. Right, so it anchors or embeds, not, not embeds, but it, it attaches through this anchoring system, a protein to a membrane. Okay. And the last thing I want to include in this lecture is a brief introduction of fat substitutes. Right, so uh, if any of you ever had plain Lay's potato chips since 1996 or seven or so, right? If you ever eaten plain Lay's potato chips, yes. they taste different than other potato chips, and this is why. So uh, a company that makes them came out with a molecule called Olestra in 1996 as a zero calorie artificial fat substitute. Okay, and how did they come up with this? Well, a normal fatty acid attached to glycerol like this, you know, it's not really attached to strings like this, but you get those ester bonds there, it looks like this, and we digest those fats. So the people sitting around at, at the Frito Lay company said, We want to make a fat substitute because fats make it taste good but we want it to have no calories we want it such that you can't digest it right so no calories but it tastes the same or similar is the idea but i want to make it cheaply of course so what do we have instead of glycerol sitting around that's very abundant and cheap we have sucrose right lots of oh groups there and to each of those oh groups will attach fatty acids right so it kind of looks like our triacylglycerol it mimics the the shape of it but you can't digest this thing at all. And they called it Olestra. The FDA approved it in 1996, and it's not harmful in any way. And it tastes sort of like normal fats. People say it has a, an aftertaste or whatever they say. And what are the benefits? Yes, you can't digest it. No calories. The problem is, if you eat this, you can't digest it, and it serves to bind other fats, right? It also binds up fat binding proteins, right? So you're gonna lose fats, you're gonna lose cholesterol, which might not be a bad thing, but you're gonna lose some proteins that normally bind fats, like the LDL proteins, and you're also gonna lose fat soluble vitamins, like A, D, E, and K, right? Those are not water soluble. So what's gonna happen if you eat this Alestra and these Lay's potato chips, and other companies bought into it as well, they licensed the patent to many companies, and the, all the, the stuff you would eat, say you ate a, you know, a whatever size bag it was, you would not be absorbing your vitamins A, D, E, and K you're normally eating. So how does a company solve that problem? Well, you have to add back more of those vitamins. So you're putting back more A, D, E, and K in your potato chips to replenish that which would be lost if you eat this. But of course on the bag it doesn't say we're adding back the vitamins that this will cause you to lose. On the bag, the marketing will say fortified with vitamins A, D, E, and K. They're not telling you why, because this thing will cause you to lose those vitamins. So they're just replenishing them. They're not fortified for your benefit. They're fortified so you don't lose as much if you eat this. Many other companies have since not used this product anymore, because of, mainly because of the way customers say it tastes. And even Frito-Lay doesn't use it very much. But in their basic Lay's potato chips, they still use this. That's why those taste different. Right. Here's a 3D version of that same molecule with the, the sucrose in the center and all those fatty tails attached in uh, a stereo view. So if you stare at this and let one eye stare at one and one eye stare at the other, and you can play this back and watch it as many times as you like until you can accomplish it, you'll see it in 3D. And this is the molecule you're eating that gives you that, that no-calorie fat substitute that they came up with.